Good afternoon. Well, I'm going to be talking about Ireland, and I'm hoping that you can draw parallels between our experience in Northern Ireland and your own experience in Sri Lanka. First of all, some introductions. Who I am. I'm a former journalist. I've worked on both sides of the border in Ireland. That's a picture of me on the bottom right-hand corner there from last week. I spoke to a congressional committee in Washington, which was uh, very interesting, and very, they were very supportive, strangely enough. Um, um, I've written a book um, called Lethal Allies, which is, will be for sale later on. Uh, we, we've uh, completed two tours of the US, and we're going to Australia in June. Um, and I'm going to be talking during this presentation about some of the things in, in the book. First of all, I work for the Pat Finucane Center, and now many of you out there might be saying, who the heck was this guy, Pat Finucane? He was a lawyer in Northern Ireland who was very successful. He was, doing, he was uh, defending uh, uh, Republicans, and he was also involved in challenging the shoot to kill episode uh, that Phil has already talked about. Uh, he was killed as he served Sunday dinner at his home in North Belfast. And we now know that there was collusion between the British state and the loyalists who pulled the trigger. The gun was supplied by a police agent. The, his, he was identified by a British Army agent. He was murdered in 1989. There's a picture there of his funeral. And you'll see his wife, Geraldine, there with a, um, <coughs> leaning on a stick. She was beside me in Washington last week when we made the presentation in Washington. And there's Geraldine and her children um, campaigning in London at the bottom there. The, the Pat Vanuken Centre that I work for uh, helps people in Northern Ireland who have questions about how their loved ones were killed. We don't care what background they come from, we give them confidential, free information. We believe that the conflict in Ireland, one of the main instigators of the conflict in Ireland, was the British state's failure to uphold human rights. And we believe that now that the conflict is over, there is a great need for um, a family-based truth recovery process. And that's the work I do. I want to talk this afternoon about some aspects of British counterinsurgency policy in Ireland. These are they. Shoot to kill, psychological operations, paramilitary policing, the use of battle-hardened British troops and the SAS, Deep interrogation, as it's sometimes called, i.e. torture, how the law was corrupted, and the um, counter-gangs and collusion, that is um, Frank Kitson's use of, of pseudo-gangs in Kenya and elsewhere, was imported to Northern Ireland. And I'm going to be focusing on some of these issues, not all of them. Before I start, I'm very aware that many of you will not be, know a lot about the Irish conflict, so... I apologise for all the acronyms that I'm going to be using, and please, if you're not certain about anything, just hold your hand up. The RUC is the police force, so there's three different groups there, the so-called security forces, which is why that's in inverted commas. The RUC were the police force. The HET, which I sometimes mention, uh, were a, 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 an arm's-length independent body that was recently disbanded that looked into the murders uh, after, uh, during the conflict after it ended, and then there's the UDR. The most important two differentiation to make is between the Ulster Defence Regiment, the UDR, which is part of the British Army, in fact the largest regiment in the British Army, and the various illegal loyalist paramilitary groups, the UDA and the UVF. Now they're illegal paramilitary groups that you could be sent to jail for if you were found to be a member of them, apart from the UDA, but I won't go into that now. Um, but the, so the UDR is part of the British Army, the UDA and the UVF are paramilitary groups, completely separate, supposedly. And then, of course, there's the IRA that you're probably more familiar with, which was on the other side, the pro-Irish pro -Irish Unity IRA. And then there's the political parties as well. Sinn Féin, you probably have heard of. The SDLP was also a nationalist party, more moderate, and there was various forms of unions. That, I realise it's a lot to take in, but uh, I'm, that's an attempt by me to sort out the acronyms for you. Okay, I want to talk a bit about the book that I wrote and published in 2013. It was limited in scope. It looked at 120 deaths. It was, if you like, a case study in collusion, which is the counter-gangs theory that Frank Kitson perfected. Um, 
Um, uh, but the most important thing to say about the book is that every thing, single thing in it is sourced. None of it is speculation or rumour. It's all sourced in official documents and in police documents. There has not been, since the book was published, any challenge to anything that's in the book. When you read it, you don't have to say, well, maybe 80% of this is true or maybe 70% of this is true. It is all true. The British government has had lawyers crawling all over it. If they'd found something in it that wasn't true, we'd know by now. So when you read, when I say what I'm going to be saying, I'm not saying it on the basis of what I think might be true. It's on the basis of actual official documents. The 120 killings that, that the book discusses took place in these areas, specific little areas, as you can see. Uh, the killers were loyalists, that is, loyalist paramilitaries, but they also included, and we name them in the book, 16 members of the British Army, 13 police officers, various other people who belong to various other units of the security forces, so-called, and these are obviously the ones that we know about, there may very well be others. Um, now, early on in the conflict in Northern Ireland, um, where you had the British Army, the guy in charge of the British Army in the North, although the British Army was supposedly there fighting both Loyalist and Republican paramilitaries, the focus was very much on Republicans. As far as the Loyalists were concerned, he was more interested in cozying up to them, in making friends with them, in forming alliances with them, rather than in confronting them and defeating them, as you can see from that document. And this tacit understanding that the, that the British Army talked about, this is the way it worked out in practice. This is the British Army patrolling um, with loyalist paramilitaries, and actually the shields they're carrying are British Army shields. So in Westminster terms, these were terrorists, but on the ground in Northern Ireland they were working hand in glove. Um, the victims, the 120 victims that, whose, whose murders I discuss in the book, uh, none of them were um, Republican paramilitaries. They were just ordinary people. Um, they were people who'd been promoted, people who had a bit of land, people who were building a new house. Um, and none of them were active Republican paramilitaries. There was one but apart from that one, everybody, all the other people who were killed were ordinary Joes. They weren't active in any um, military way, or even, most of them, any political way. And if they did have any contacts with politics, they were contacts with the moderate SDLP. So, um, although that changed later on in the conflict, those were people who were killed in the 1970s in the murder triangle, so called. <coughs> Now, this is the first official document I'm going to show you. London created the Ulster Defence Regiment, which became the largest regiment in the British Army. And when they created it, they knew, even as they were creating it, that this would attract Loyalist paramilitaries to join. So Loyalists would join, and they would become trained, and they would have access to weapons. Um, so here we have in June 90, um, uh, July 1972... The British Army letter to another, this is an internal British Army document, that says it's inevitable that members of the Loyalist paramilitaries will join the UDA, but knowing it was inevitable didn't stop them creating this regiment and training and arming one side in the conflict, that is the pro-British side. And as predicted, that's exactly what happened, and this is a document, another document, that shows that between 5 and 15% of members of the largest regiment in the British Army were active loyalist paramilitaries. But it wasn't a priority. They didn't care. They knew it was happening, but they simply didn't care. And they, they didn't do anything to ensure that dubious types who might use the training and the weapons to which they had access were kept out of the British Army. No, they welcomed them in with open arms. And of course, somebody had to pay a price for this policy. It's ordinary people always seem to pay a price for policies like this. And when, and when there, the concern, if there was any concern in London, wasn't that loyalist paramilitaries would be armed and trained and set out, sent out to kill ordinary Catholic people. 
The concern was that somebody might find out about it. So there we have a report here that um, it, there was concern that this might become public knowledge. This information was kept from the public, deliberately kept from the public. And this is the result, this is the outworkings of a policy of allowing loyalist paramilitaries and encouraging them to become trained and armed. You have horrendous bombings like the one that took place in Dublin and Monaghan. The largest single day of carnage in the entire 35 history of the Northern Ireland conflict was in Dublin and Monaghan. We know that at least three members of the British Army were involved, and probably more. After the Dublin Monaghan bombings, did the British government suddenly realise the implications of what it had been doing? No, it continued to meet leading loyalist figures, even in the few days after those same loyalists had been responsible for such loss of life on the streets of Dublin. Other families also paid a price. These, this couple were murdered on their way home from, uh, from work and their daughter was very badly injured. And the man, was, one of the men responsible was a member of the British Army. Uh, he was described in court as a telecommunications engineer, not as a member of the British Army, because they wanted to keep it hidden, the fact that they were training and arming killers and in uniform. This was the most popular um, show band, pop band in Ireland at the time. They were, they were uh, ambushed on the side of a road coming home from a concert and slaughtered. The British also knew at the time that the people they were encouraging to join the British Army were stealing guns from arsenals and sending them out for, their, for, for themselves and for others to use against the Catholic population. And they were talking about collusion even as early as 1972. They knew there was collusion going on, these are internal documents, but at the time they were denying that collusion existed. Huge, um, I mean, there were massive raids on British Army arsenals and huge quantities of weapons were taken and later used against unarmed civilians. This, there were monthly logs of all the weapons that were going missing, uh, and there's the word collusion again twice on that document. So they knew that these weapons weren't just going missing, they were being deliberately taken from British Army arsenals to be used against defenceless people in the community. In fact, it was so bad that the Ulster Defence Regiment, the, main, the largest regiment in the British Army, was the main source of all loyalist weapons used against people, and the only source of modern weapons. And this was the price that was paid. These people whose faces you see before you were all killed with one of those weapons. Dozens, hundreds, thousands went missing. And these are people who were killed with just one of them. There was no investigation into this weapon going missing. This, the unit wasn't stood down while the police investigated. And all these people were killed with one of these hundreds if not thousands of weapons. And Trevor Brecknell, whose photograph is there, his colleague, his son, is my colleague Alan Brecknell, who worked with me on writing the book. The collusion that was going on at the time within the Ulster Defence Regiment was known of at the highest level the highest political level. We found this document in the files at Kew that shows that when Harold Wilson, who was then British Prime Minister, um, wanted to brief Margaret Thatcher, who'd just been elected leader of the British Conservative Party, and they, they had a meeting together with Merlin Rees, who was um, Harold Wilson's Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, um, the uh, Rees uh, briefed those present, including Mrs. Thatcher, who went on, of course, to become Prime Minister, there were certain elements in the police who were very close to the UVF, the UVF being an illegal paramilitary organisation. And, this is Merlin Reef speaking again, the armies, that is the British Army's own judgement, is that the Ulster Defence Regiment, that's the largest regiment within the same British Army, were heavily infiltrated by extremist Protestants, i.e. by loyalist paramilitaries, and in a crisis situation, the UDR could not be relied upon to follow orders. So we say that it wasn't a case of just a few rotten apples in Northern Ireland. This was systemic. These were people put in to do a job. 
And this is why it's so important to understanding the conflict in Ireland and maybe understanding the conflict that you're more concerned about in Sri Lanka, is collusion is so important to understanding. Most of you probably believe, most people in Britain and Ireland actually still believe, that what happened over 35 years in Northern Ireland was that two groups of people, Catholics and Protestants, fought each other for sectarian religious reasons. It was a religious war. Um, and that Britain, wonderful London, wonderful Westminster, was there to try and keep the peace between these irrational, warring tribes. And loyalists and Republicans, Protestant and Catholic paramilitaries, whatever you want to call them, were just as bad as each other. We say that if you accept that collusion was a policy, then you have to look at it in a completely different way. And that is that the, the, the war in the conflict in Northern Ireland was a colonial conflict. It wasn't a sectarian religious war. It was a colonial conflict. So, you might be asking yourselves, well, why, what was in it for London? Why did London support collusion? And we believe that fairly early on in the conflict, London recognised that it was going to be impossible to defeat the IRA by military means. So what they were trying to do was to try to terrorise the whole Catholic population into turning its back on the IRA, into reducing its, its political, economic, and social aspirations. Saying, listen, we better not ask for civil rights. We better not ask for national rights. We better not ask for any contact with Dublin, any constitutional link with Dublin, because if we do, we're going to get killed by these people who are armed within the British Army and sent out to kill us. And did it work? We contend... Um, some people will say, well, the British, the British government was facing this dreadful, and they were dreadful, the British government was facing this dreadful threat from the IRA, they were bombing London, they were killing people. It's okay then. They had to use, they had to compromise, they had to blur the lines, and it was okay for them to use collusion and to arm and train one section of the community against another. But we asked, did it save lives? Did it bring the conflict to an end any closer and we say that it most certainly did not. Not only was it unethical and illegal, it also was totally ineffective as a policy. Now, we produced the book, and we sent the book to the British government. We gave them, offered them advance notice, but they haven't, in, in nearly 18 months now since the book was published, we haven't had a single response from London. We reckon if they had anything to say, they would have said it by now. We believe that collusion not only did it not work, it actually made things worse. Because not only were ordinary Catholic civilians, unarmed civilians killed, but it led to increasing sense of antagonism between the two communities, and that as a result, members of the IUC and the British Army were also killed. It wasn't just Catholic civilians. It was their own people as well. And it does fit in to... I looked... Um, I looked at what the British did between the end of the Second World War and when the army arrived in Northern Ireland in the early 1970s. And I looked at General Sir Frank Kitson, his policy of using surrogates to do the dirty work that they didn't want to dirty their hands with. And uh, it was very similar in all these different places. There were differences, obviously, but the parallels were there as well. And it <coughs> continues right up until today, because even now... Um, um, special forces so-called or surrogates or um, intermediaries are used by armies throughout the world to do the dirty work that they don't want to do and they set people against each other and foster hostility between communities in Afghanistan just as they did in Northern Ireland and elsewhere. I want also to talk about the way that the law was corrupted, the way that the law which is supposed to be there to protect all of us, that we are all equal before the law and uh, the law has to be administered impartially, how that was corrupted in Northern Ireland. This is a little bar in the countryside just outside of a village called Cayley. Uh, it was attacked by a gang. It was entirely of police officers, not a combination of police officers and loyalist paramilitaries. The gang was entirely uh, con consisted of police officers. They raked the bar with gunfire and they threw a bomb in, and the only person to be injured was Michael Cabra, who was walking outside the bar. These are three of the police officers involved in that attack. They all got off with suspended sentences. 
although they were involved in an attempt at mass murder. In his explanation, the Lord Chief Justice, Lord Lowry, the chief, uh, the most senior judge in Northern Ireland, who gave them all suspended sentences, said that he didn't think that um, after all these police officers who tried to kill as many people as possible had endured, that they needed to be reformed. And he excused them by saying, well, they felt, these police officers felt, that more than ordinary police work was needed to rid the land of the pestilence which has been in, in existence. So, in effect, he was saying it's quite okay for police officers to go out and put on the uniforms apparently in, in, and, and try and kill as many people as possible. Now, the historical inquiries team, when they co they commented on Lord, Lord Chief Justice Lowry's judgment, um, this is the the, the uh, a new unit that was set up, which has now been disbanded, but it was looking into some of the murders in Northern Ireland. Uh, they say that they just can't believe that he got away with it. As you can see, it's difficult to conceive of a statement that could be more fundamentally flawed. Now, all these, all these circles, these red circles here, were people who were killed with the same guns that were used in the Rock Bar attack. So we know that the same people who were involved, i.e. police officers who were involved in the Rock Bar attack, because that was entirely police officers, were also, the same guns were used in all these other attacks. But did the police look into it? Did they investigate? Absolutely not. And we are, and the HET asked itself, well, why did the police not investigate? And they come to the conclusion is that if they had investigated, then the good name of the IUC, the good name of the police force, would have been fatally undermined. So best not to look. Now the law should work in as much as the police are meant to gather evidence, they present the evidence to the DPP, who decides whether there's sufficient evidence to bring charges and then <coughs> charges are brought. And then people go to court and the judge, the judge and jury decide guilt or innocence. That's how it should work. But in fact, during the conflict in Northern Ireland, we found documents that show that very early on, the British Army was concerned that soldiers might face charges of using lethal force, i.e. killing people, murdering people. So they came to a sort of little secret deal between themselves that, um, that whenever a, a British soldier was charged with um, wrongful use of violence or lethal force or murder, that they would review it between them so that, um, so that he didn't necessarily have to face any charges. And the outcome of those special arrangements is that although 350 people were directly killed by British soldiers, and many more were killed in collusion between British soldiers and loyalist paramilitaries, no cop was ever convicted of murder during the entire conflict, and only four soldiers were ever convicted of murder, and all went, were released within five years, and all went back to join their regiments. So the law was well and truly corrupted. Short, short uh, conclusion. Talking about policing, um, hardened British Army units who would have been, which have been used in other parts and other colonial conflicts were drafted into Northern Ireland and basically let run, including the SAS, the Parachute Regiment that was involved in Bloody Sunday and various other <coughs> regiments, including the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, who I'm going to talk about a bit. Now, the SAS arrived in Ireland... They were there already before 1976, but they were moved in in January 1976, officially. They were already undercover, um, involved deeply, but they were brought in officially in January 1976. And they were sent straight to South Armagh from Dauphin in the Middle East. And the an, another group of people that were sent in to keep the peace, allegedly, were the Argyll and Southern and Highlanders, who had served in Aden whose regimental commander was Mad Mitch, with a kind of gung-ho, let's go out and kill a mentality. Um, and then, of course, they were involved in killing people in Northern Ireland as well. Uh, they arrived, they arrived, I suppose, and they were battle-hardened from, from, out, out, um, from killing people in outright warfare in Aden, and they used the same tactics when they arrived in Northern Ireland. The same sort of human rights abuses that they had conflicted on the people in Aden. Uh, it wasn't. I, it wasn't quite as bad when they, they they got away with more in Aden. It's easier to kill people wholesale in a far flung part of the empire than it is to kill people in Ireland. But nevertheless, they obviously felt they had carte blanche. 
Um, when the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders arrived, for example, in County Fermanagh, they carried out a very brutal double murder in the area, and uh, they both they they that that was they were convicted for that. It was quite amusing, really, but when they first when the soldiers first arrived in Ireland from Aden, and there was a riot on the Falls Road in West Belfast. They unfurled a banner on the Falls Road telling people to go home and not to riot. And the banner was in Arabic. And of course, the people in the Falls Road couldn't really understand much Arabic. Um, this is the sort of attitude of uh, someone like Mad Mitch, basically, who sees anybody who isn't on his side as being subhuman. Um, and has no concept whatsoever of proper policing or human rights, a very, very blunt instrument. And this, again, is Brian Beatty that, uh, that Phil was talking about. He had a, a pedigree elsewhere in the world before he arrived in Northern Ireland, um, and he, had, he was forced at one point to go down to Dublin and try and explain why his members, his men, had crossed over into the border with the South. <coughs> And he told the court in Dublin this was a map reading error, which caused a lot of hilarity, as you can imagine. These SAS men didn't know where they were. Changing, uh, changing the subject now until torture. Um, torture is unique in international law because there is never a derogation for torture. Torture is never officially um, allowed, ever. And there is no derogation permitted, and there's no statute of limitations. So... Uh, it's not a question you can say, oh, well, that was so many years ago, uh, you don't have to, you can't be charged. It's, uh, it's regarded as seriously as that. Torture is never, ever, ever acceptable. No matter what the provocation, no matter what situation, torture under international human rights law is never, never acceptable. However, in the other parts of the world, the British um, managed to hone this technique where torture didn't leave physical scars. Sometimes it didn't leave physical scars, sometimes it did. And they're having honed these techniques in other parts of the world, they brought them to Northern Ireland. And as you've seen from Phil's presentation, there was hooding, white noise, food and water deprivation, and stress positions. But this had a dreadful psychological effect on people. This is, a very, this is quite, isn't quite amusing. When I was in Kew, uh, looking at the National Archives, I found various documents in which it's claimed that the hooding element of the dis, dis, um, disengagement of the torture was, uh, the British said, this, this chap, Colonel Nicholson, who was responsible for, for, the, for the interrogations, he said that the men who were, who were being tortured voluntarily put their own hoods on. They voluntarily got the hoods and put them on themselves. <laughs> It's actually there, and of course I went straight back and asked the people who were actually tortured, and they said, absolutely not. They never voluntarily put hoods on themselves. It's ridiculous. This is one um, man who was, who was tortured and, and subsequently died as a result. He was arrested on a geographical basis. He lived in part of Northern Ireland that they wanted to find out more about, so they just lifted him because he was from that part of the world. No other reason. He had a heart problem. He was medically assessed as unfit for deep interrogation, but he was nevertheless interrogated. His hair turned white within a week. When he was released, he was released straight into the care of a psychiatric unit. Such were his mental damage, the mental damage that the torture had caused, and he did eventually die of a heart attack. The Irish government has taken um, took a case against London's use of torture. And they were lied to, and as a result of them being lied to, we've turned up uh, documents that show they were lied to. And so they've referred the case back to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and this is a letter that we found in queue that shows the, the British were using the word torture, even as they were telling people that they weren't torturing, they actually were, and they referred to it as torture. And the international fallout, of course, has been that that ruling by the European Court of Human Rights which was a ruling made on the basis of lies that the British told the court, has been used in, every part, in all these different parts of the world to justify the use of torture. So my conclusion is, 
that the British used counter gangs, they corrupted the law, they forced paramilitary policing on the people, they used torture, they used lethal force against civilians, in all right the way through the conflict in Northern Ireland. And we have to ask ourselves, is there nothing that our governments won't stoop to? Are there any human rights norms that they won't break? And my answer to that is no, there aren't. Thank you very much.